Good morning, everybody. Praise the name of Jesus. The good news in a few words. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That's from the book of Romans, chapter 5. Amen. Please be seated and turn in, the go in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, beginning at verse 1. And Jesus said to his disciples, things that cause people to sin are bound to come. But woe to that person through whom they come. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. I want to read so this little book that I brought to you at Christmas time. A good old age, there's in the chapter B, about belief, the author pens these words. He says, Paul and the other apostles knew that in this human life, they would never attain perfection and perfect likeness to their Savior. Yet they also knew that as we daily confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Then he says these interesting words. Do not be surprised that your sense of sin might increase in your old age. This scripture came to me early in the week and I wrestled with what to do with it and I didn't know. I couldn't go anywhere with it. I just kept thinking about forgiveness and and then on Friday, I went to a, a wake slash funeral with Kathy for a 92-year-old man. And I'm going to use first names here. His name was Dan. And he was a part of Kathy's life in a number of different ways, probably as early as she can remember when she was three. And so he was a person that had an impact on her life. And he had four children, three sons, one daughter. And they're all grown now. He was 92, as I said. The daughter I knew a little bit. She was a customer of mine when I was the service director at Natick Ford and Natick Dodge many, many years ago. The next son, Ron, I knew very, very little. Met him once, twice, three times, I don't remember. Knew him very little. Then there was Dan, the third son, or the second son, and I knew him probably as well as any of them in terms of spending time with them. And then there was the last of the four, his name was Philip. And Philip was one of those people that I knew. Didn't spend a lot of time with Philip, but I knew Philip. I don't know if you know what I mean by that, but there was a kindred spirit. And it was interesting, this funeral. It was a celebration of life. You ever go into a wake and it's just like, 
whoa, I hate going here. Never doing this again. But then you go to a place like this and the line just keep, the people just keep coming and the, the energy and the, the positivity and the, just the, the tribute paid to the person's life because they did touch a per, other many people's lives. And that's what was, that's what happened here at this place. And after the visitation time was over and they, had a, they didn't have a religious service as such, they had a, just a little memorial time together and all four of the, the children stood up front and shared. And the interesting part to me was just the differentiation of what they shared and how they shared it. Diana, the oldest, the daughter, she's, what, 67, 68 years old, maybe looks 52, six foot, six foot one, slim, gorgeous, always just been one of these striking beauties. When she walks in a room, it's just like, whoa, who's that? And she had memories of things and events of her life with her dad, and she shared those memories, things, events. The one most poignant that was most present to her was something that happened recently as she had come to visit her dad, and she was saying goodbye, and he looked up at her, and he says, man, you got beautiful teeth. <laughs> Just out of the blue. And so she thanked her dad for her teeth and for the, the good genes that him and her, mo her mother had uh, imparted to, to her. And then came Ron. Ron is the one who I knew little of. Only met him a couple, three times. Probably most of it in situations of weddings or funerals. And, and Ron, he took out his paper and he unfolded it and he looked and he said, dear Jesus. And he formed his thoughts as a prayer. And I'm thinking, wow, where did this come from? This is not a, a Christian family. But Ronnie knows the Lord and he, he walks with the Lord and he is steadfast in his faith. And he offered a very loving, kind and gracious prayer on behalf of his heart and on behalf of his father as a tribute, and he said that he had taken the time and presented the gospel to his father. And he said he listened, he paid attention, he shook his head, and he didn't know what went on inside of his father as a result of the presentation of the gospel. And I don't remember exactly how long ago this was, but I don't think it was a long, long time ago. But it was a blessing to have someone there that had the boldness to bring the gospel and to pray to the Lord. And then came Danny, the junior. And Danny's the one that I've known the most or spent the most time with, and he is a competitive person. He, is, he, he re recollected fishing trips, hunting trips, memories of family, his father's character, how he honored his word. He paid a nice little tribute to his father in the way that he did. And then came Philip, the gentlest of all four of them. And this is the guy that I say I knew. And he recounted a story. He had a little piece of paper. All the rest of them had, you know, notes and Philip had this little piece of paper and he made, he acknowledged that. He says, all I got is this. And he says, I don't know. And he said, when I was freshman in high school, I went out for the football team because that's what you do. And he said it was August and it was double sessions. If you know what that means, practice in the morning, lunch, practice in the afternoon, hot, 
dry, thirsty. And after the first morning session of the first day, he said, this is not for me. I do not want to do this. And so he didn't go back. He told the coach, I'm, this ain't for me. I'm not, I'm not coming back this afternoon. But he didn't go home. And he didn't tell his mom and his dad what he had decided to do. Instead, he found a place to hang out. And when it came time to go home, he made sure that he ran most of the way so that he was sweating when he got home. <laughs> Looked like he had done something. And he continued to live this little lie for a number of days until at some point, parents found out that he wasn't going to football practice. And his dad did not respond very well or react very well to this news. In fact, all three of the other brothers and sisters said we wanted no part of what was going on in that house at that time. And what Dan did, his harsh response, affected his son in a very negative way. It hurt his son in a very substantial way. And it was never addressed. It was never addressed. But he shared that at his father's funeral. But the end of the story, or the rest of the story, is that near the very end of his life, Dan, senior, the old man, talked to Philip about what had happened. And he told him he felt bad about it. And Philip, all Philip shared was that we talked about it a couple times, as late as January, to make sure things were right. He never said his father apologized. He never said that he repented. He just shared that they, things were right. And I rejoiced in my heart for Philip in that because that can be something terrible to carry with you if it's not addressed before the end comes. And so the reason I went, Kathy said, you don't have to go, you're not feeling well, you don't have to go, it's okay. But I went because I wanted to be there with her, for her, because like I said, she'd known this family since she was three years old. And I've known them too, and it was just, it was good to go. It was the right thing to do there, to be there with Kathy. Someone that close to her family and to her parents. Scabs are still healing. So after we were all done and we, we, we were going on the ride home, I said to her, I said, so how, how was that for you? How are you feeling? And she said, you know, I felt, it took her a, a couple seconds to come up with the word. She said, I felt removed from what was happening there. She said, Dan Tower, I'm sorry, Dan was a hard man. He was a difficult man. He was harsh. And he was all about money. And money affected his relationships. And I had interaction with this man that involved money, and it didn't go well. And there was no reason for it to not go well, because I had gone beyond what he was reasonably, should have reasonably accept, expected. And his good friend Cliff, my father-in-law, who was a very smart man. He was disabled as a result of things during the Korean War and his military service, and he received partial pension through the VA as a result of that. And Dan really wanted to know what percentage he was receiving from the government for this disability because evidently Dan was receiving something and he wanted to compare apples to apples and he wanted to know. 
And he wanted to know so bad that he let it affect the relationship because Cliff was a smart man and he wanted no part of that conversation. He says, I don't want to tell you, you know. And it, he allowed it to affect their interpersonal relationship and their ability to be friends. And it did, it harmed that relationship in, in its later years, which was sad. And there was a positive energy there in that place because the man touched a lot of lives and he lived a good life in many terms, healthy, productive, Four children, eight grandchildren, 15 great-grandchildren, something like that. But the most powerful thing was the talk that Philip gave about the forgiveness because I lost a lot of respect for the man over the years because of the things that he dealt with in his life with regards to affecting relationship between people that cared for him how other things were more important than that. But in that moment when Phillips mentioned that his father had come to him and restored and tried to get back, to make right what he had done wrong, that overcame every thought of disrespect that I ever had for him. And I was really grateful to know that that had happened. And I hope that in his heart, the gospel took root just enough. Do you know what I mean? Just enough. No one of us can put God in a box when it comes to a man or a woman's salvation in their relationship with God and Jesus Christ. Explain the thief on the cross to me theologically. I'll listen. But I wouldn't waste my time. Because that puts God in a box. Theology puts God in a box. And I don't want a God who's in the box. I want a God who can say to me, if he sins against you seven times in a day and he comes back to you seven times in that day and says, I repent, you must forgive him. In this scripture, in Luke 17, Jesus is talking to his disciples. He is talking to those men and women who would become ministers of his life after he left. He is beginning to prepare them for their ministry. And people were used to being judged. People were used to being restricted by rules. The woman caught in adultery stoned her to death. And you can rightfully do so because the law says so. But in chapter 16 of Luke, Jesus explained to them the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John the Baptist. And since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached. The good news of Jesus Christ is being preached. The good news of unqualified forgiveness for all of our sins was beginning at the beginning of time, at the end of John the Baptist's life, at the beginning of Jesus' life. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples the priorities, and he begins with this, this unusual statement. If your brother sins seven times, you must forgive him seven times. And in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told them, he told Peter, he said, if your brother, Lord, if my brother sins against me seven times, do I have to forgive him seven times? He said, yeah, well, not more than that. Seven times, 70. In other words, there is no limit to the forgiveness that you are qualified, you are committed to giving. 
We are compelled to be this because it is, represents the character of our Father. The second point about this scripture is, is that sin is in the world and it touches each one of us and it has a hold on some of us, has had a hold on all of us at some point in time. Jesus said, the poor will always be with you and so it is with sin. Sin will always be in this world, and sin touches each one of us. The things that cause people to stumble, the things that cause people to sin, are bound to come and to continue. But woe to that person through whom they come. Woe to that person through whom they come. Now remember, he's talking to his followers. He's talking to his disciples. He's preparing them for what they are going to come up against. He's saying, watch yourselves, that you do not impart sin. You have to be so cautious of your behavior, because I'm talking about little ones, he says. It would be better for the person who brings sin, through whom sin comes, to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. The little ones he's talking about are seekers. He's talking about spiritually young people. People who are ripe and ready to receive the gospel. Well, if they see Peter and John arguing over who is the greatest in the kingdom, what effect is that going to have on them and their view of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We are to be very cautious of the spiritually young in our midst. Those who are seeking, those who are shapeable, those who are moldable, those who the Lord is doing a work in, whose hearts are being plowed and turned over, ready to receive that which the Lord has for them. The calling that they have. And again, I ask you to remember that he's talking to his disciples. He's preparing them. He says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. Rebuke, I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary, means to criticize sharply, to reprimand. And so I looked up the Greek word. Because that didn't seem to be characteristic of what Jesus was trying to say here. The Greek word means to esteem. To mete out in proper measure. To give a proper warning to prevent something from going wrong. That's the meaning of the Greek word that is translated rebuke, which means reprimand. It means to speak the truth in love. Sin will always be with us, but woe to the one through whom, whom sin comes. If I take my daughter and I hurt her with my words, as a result of the sinfulness inside of me, I have done something to one of those little ones. And that needs to be made good. And it's the same way in the body of Christ. We live and work and dwell together and fellowship together. And we need to be wary. We need to, it's, Jesus said, take heed of yourselves. Watch yourselves that these things don't take root in your midst. Remember, he's talking to his disciples again. Be careful that these things don't grow up inside of you so that you are bearing that in, as a witness in front of other people. So when it comes to speaking to one another about things that we see that are not right in our midst, 
We need to esteem one another because we love one another because we need to forgive as our Father has forgiven us. We need to give a proper warning to prevent something from going wrong. And this is a hard part to deal with. If he sins against you, if he sins against you seven times, and yet comes back seven times and says, I repent, forgive him. A new standard. If my daughter makes the same mistake seven times or 700 times and my words go out to her they would be rebuke in the form of something that is loving and kind and wanting the best for her not wanting something bad to happen not wanting for something to go wrong but to push her along a path that she should know is a better way of going. It's up to her to receive that word, to receive that encouragement, that esteeming, with the proper attitude. And because sin has touched us all and because sin has a hold on some of us, it can be a lifelong process for that sin to be cast off for us to have victory over that sin, for us not to be overwhelmed by that sin, to be reprogrammed, reconditioned, to have our minds renewed in the proper way. But in the meantime, it is up to each one of us not to harbor bad will in our heart, but to forgive. Alistair Begg gave a message, maybe 1992, and I listened to it a while back. And he said this idea of, of forgiving a repetitive violator, someone who sins against you, it's a willful act, and it can be difficult. And he used a, um, an illustration of you're on your computer and you get a pop-up window. And you click the X to make it go away and it comes back. Click the X to make it go away and it comes back and again and again and again. And he says, you can forgive them and walk away from it but your enemy is going to make that come back to your mind. It's going to pop it up in your memory and the pain you're going to feel. The want, the need for retribution. But you have to say, go away. I resist this. I forgive you. I forgive them. Take it away, Lord. And eventually it will go away if you have that attitude. And it must be up to us to be the first to forgive, to harbor no ill will against anyone, especially and first and foremost in the body of Christ. Otherwise, we become weak together. We must be the first to reach out, the first to embrace. Now, I had the picture in my mind as I wrote those words down of the prodigal father who took his sash and lashed it up so his garment wouldn't impede his stride. And he ran when he saw his son coming back. He ran to the opportunity to reconcile with no ill will in his heart, but only wanting to prevent it from becoming worse, but to make it better by his love. And he embraced his son heartily. We must be the first to love in every situation. 
But this is what Christ was teaching his disciples to do. No judgment, understanding. I want to go back to just one thing, because Kathy and I talked about this to some degree with regards to something that we're dealing with in our lives. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Well, there are laws at work in this world. Natural laws of God at work in this world. And if I tell a person, this is what's going to happen if you continue this behavior, and they continue that behavior, I can forgive the behavior. I understand sin will always be here. Sin will always entangle us. And they come back again and they say, I'm sorry, I did it again. I understand, but you understand where this is taking you. There's pain involved here. There's difficulty that this is going to produce in your soul and in your life. And you will eventually have to suffer with the ramifications of what you are doing. God cannot be mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. If he sows to his flesh, he will reap death. If he sows to his spirit, he will reap eternal life. That's God's word. And that's the principle that's at work here. I can offer words of encouragement, words of esteeming, words of proper advice in the situation, and I can give them my forgiveness and not judge and walk away. But it's still up to that person to deal with the reality of and effects of their actions in this life. So, I was glad that Dan reached out to his son. And like I said, forgiveness is a great blessing. And love can overcome a multitude of sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I lift up our little church to you and I ask you, Lord God, to bring your spirit to bear in our hearts and in our minds. And if there is anything that we have within our midst that needs to be spoken to, please give us the courage to do that. Help us to love one another without reservation, hesitation, or limit, just as we are loved. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So Lord God, I thank you for your word and for this word. And I thank you for that family, Lord God, that you would bless them. Help them to grieve the loss of their father. But Lord, take the words of Ron and the words of Philip and use that in that family to, to grow them in their spirits and in their hearts and knit them closer together. And may Jesus Christ receive the honor and the glory for this in all things. In his name I pray. Amen. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together we may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in every thought, in every word, and in every deed. And all God's people said, Amen.